Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts. Tonight, a special one-on-one -on -one conversation with Supervisor Janet Wolf. After 12 years on the board, Supervisor Wolf has decided to step away from the wacky world of elective office and recently announced she will not seek another term. She joins us tonight to share some of her reflections on her experience in office, policy, political, and personal, and to offer some thoughts about what she sees down the road for Santa Barbara County. Janet, welcome, and thank you so Hi, much Jerry. for coming. It's nice to be with you again. Born uh, 1954, oh, raised well, in thank you. Playa you just del Rey. Gave away my, my age. BS from uh, <laughs> well, what, May 17. Well, okay, never mind. UCSB, Masters from UCLA. You married your junior high school sweetheart, Harvey. Mm -hmm. Three daughters. Moved to Santa Barbara in 1981. Worked in vocational rehab. Elected to Goleta School Board in 1993. First elected to the Board of Supervisors in 2006. Now, I always want to ask you this. You had a heart attack in 2004 mm -hmm. and ran for the, the board in 2006. What made you think that serving on the Board of Supervisors would be good for your heart? Uh, well, first of all, you, ha you know, I was on the Goleta School Board for three terms. So I completed my term in, I think it was, well, it was in 2004, mm -hmm. and not too long after that, I had my heart attack. Oh. So in theory, someone might say, well, you know, I, I was off, off the school board and stress-free, and why did I have my heart attack? But, and um, so that's but, a good theory. Yeah, so, well, yeah, except it, you know, it's one of those things. That, you know, I have um, heart disease in my family, and it was very unusual because I was 49, and um, as was the case back then, I think there's a lot more information out now about women and heart disease but back then um, a lot of folks they especially you know one of my doctors didn't think I was having a heart attack so by the time I did get into the hospital they I, they put in a stent I, I actually was very lucky they um, the artery was a completely occluded and they oh. put in a stent and I was fine and no and problem went, since no problem since you know I went through cardiac rehab I you know just you know, it's a re-education for me, and so I never really. It didn't you know, some stop people, you. It some, didn't slow you down. No, it was not going to stop me. I had been thinking about running for supervisor. I really wanted to do it, and my recovery was really good. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to let this stop me from running. No. Oh. So. so 12 years is a long time you've been on the board. Um, mm -hmm. You got elected before the iPhone was invented. <laughs> <laughs> before our recent series of wildfires. But we did have cell phones. We had yes. those flip flip yeah. ones, yeah, before the, all these huge new state mandates for housing. What's the biggest change that you have seen in Santa Barbara in your time? What's changed since 12 years ago now? What's different? Well, you know, it's hard for me to look at the entire county, but I, I will I will do that. I'll start there because, um, you know, there was a lot of division between the north and the south, and you know there was that that time when um, the north actually wanted to separate That's from right. the south. And I think over time, um, although this does come up occasionally, not as much as it used to, um, but I think over time we have started to see ourselves as one county. Um, working together and and helping each other where we can, and I, I think that's you know on that large scale. I think that's one of the big changes. How about in your district? In my district, um, which is uh, which the second is, district, which, which is, is tell us yeah where where, where that is. So the time. so the second district um, is actually the smallest district geographically. It's like a little tiny ball if you look on on a map. It's very dense, and. But all the districts, all five districts, have about the same population, almost 90,000 people. So my district also has about 90,000 people. And part of the district includes the city of Santa Barbara. Then on the other side, a small part of the city of Goleta. And then in the middle is this very large, unincorporated um, Goleta, eastern Goleta Valley, which um, has been called no Lita. I like to call it Go Lita, or the official word is really Eastern Goleta Valley. And so, um, you know, when I got on the board, there had been a lot of um, lot of concern about growth and housing development. And one of the first things I did in 2008 was to initiate a Goleta community plan. And um, we had members from the community who were involved in developing that plan. 
We got it through the Board of Supervisors. It's recently been approved by the Coastal Commission. And it's really um, a roadmap for development in this eastern Goleta Valley. And it's very balanced. Um, there's um, areas for development. There's, um, it was really important. The community wanted to ensure that we kept open space and ag, ag land. Um, we don't have very much when you're in this little, you know, densely populated area. Right. So like around Hollister and up on in Moore Mesa. We, I mean, there's some really important treasured spaces. And so, so that change would be that if those issues have not all been resolved, they have at least now have a have, have a, a platform where, That's right. where they can we, be. We have we do we have a we have a roadmap of um, we've up we um, changed some of the zoning up on Upper Hollister for mixed use, um, and and not only in the in the lower portion but also in the mountainous areas up up in the foothills. Yeah. we've included. Um, a focus on ash and watersheds, and so there's an environmental component um, as well. What is, what do you think? I mean, the state obviously is being extremely aggressive. Sacramento is being oh. extremely aggressive in 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 pushing mandates for yeah. growth and right. and more housing onto local government, and really trying to take a lot of the power and authority away from local government. What effect do you think that that new raft of legislation would have on programs like the East Valley uh, Community Plan. Yeah, I think I think it would uproot, I, you know, <laughs> I, the, the years uh, and time that people spent in developing this community plan to have um, an order from Sacramento, which, which basically, in essence, could, could throw out the community plan. Um, the county actually wrote a, bill, um, a letter in opposition of the bill. Um, it's his name S from Wiener in San Francisco, yeah. yes. So, um, because we, we actually like local control. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's a, it's always been Are a Are you concerned about how that's gonna play out, or do you think Well, that yeah, if that passes, it, I am concerned. I am concerned of what impact it would have. You know, there's provisions in the bill, um, you know, especially along transportation yes. corridors that yes. it would impact. Well, when we did the com community plan, that was taken into account. So, you know, there is, that's when I talked about the mixed use on Upper Hollister. Uh -huh. they, they did take that in, into account. They understood the importance of, of, you know, some development on transportation corridors. But it's, it is limited, um, and it was community-based. So I think it was, a, there was a balanced approach. Because also on Hollister, we've got these incredible ag parcels. So we want to, we want to preserve that environment that people, I mean, we, me, we all hold so incredibly special. So I think there needs to be a balance. And, and someone in San Francisco, you know, writing this legislation that will impact us locally, I just think it's really an affront to um, what I do, what the people who've donated their, you know, their time and effort into our yeah, and it, and well, if you look what happens, I mean, it's, I mean, the power is in LA and it's in San Francisco. So their perspective on it is a very urban, high density urban perspective. So yeah, why don't we just add 50,000 yeah. more units or something like that. So, um, well, I'm sorry you're not gonna be around to fight against them for that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'll still be around oh, to you'll fight. Still I'll still be around to so fight. So what's the one thing uh, that you're most proud of, that you can you point to and say, you know, that's a something that benefits the community that's gonna out outlast my time that wouldn't have happened without me what, what what's the what's the what's the one thing well you know you know no one person gets things done um, so sometimes it's just you know the art of persuasion to, to get things done um, but it, anyway I think the Goleta community plan was probably the highlight because that will you know that goes on for 20 years and um, and that really was an important milestone I think um, Public safety was really a big issue when I ran, and um, so I guess if I was to pick one thing, it's the building of the emergency operations yeah, center. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, what's your assessment of how the county did? Well, in, no, don't you want to talk about what I'm most proud of? <laughs> no, 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 but that's that's what you just, you, I'm sorry, you said it's the emergency operation. Yes, I know, it but then you... It just happened to then be you, my next question, oh, but go ahead, no, no. no finish talking about it. Well, I was just going to say that when I, got on, when I got on the board, we had the Zaka fire, the, the, right. the Gap fire, the Jesus, it was just one fire after another, and we were operating out of a little, a trailer off of Kyrie Al. 
And as everyone knows, in an emergency, time is of the essence. And it was taking us a couple hours at least just to get phone lines set up and computers set up. And um, so we were, losing, we were losing valuable time. At the same time, um, we had an offer uh, from a, a private nonprofit to donate money to the county to build a state-of-the-art emergency operations center. And um, my colleagues at the time were a little, were reluctant because we had to put in um, some of our general fund money. Mm -hmm. And I fought really hard to get that emergency operations center because we had this uh, funding from um, a very generous donor and I thought that it was time that we absolutely needed it. And now, of course, we've used it for um, the pipeline, the planes, uh, the, that that whole although issue. although the, the oil company didn't want to let you in to, oh, the, you to the emergency I know I was I was offended when the, 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 was the very, spill when yes. when, uh, they, when they they the, the, the guard the guard said we weren't allowed and I had to say I I'm sorry this is I a built this this is a county building <laughs> Um, you were, yeah, you that, were a little more angry about it at the time as I recall. Well, I was a little angry about a lot of yeah. things back then um, they were really keeping us and the press and the public really in my opinion really out of the picture and so yeah I was I and I was chair of the board at the time and so it, w it was frustrating but getting back to your yeah. so but anyway the EOC is is pretty incredible so how did it function in the Thomas fire and and the Montecito debris flow and and more specifically how how do you think that county emergency and officials responded to that in um, well, the Thomas fire or the Both. the yeah. You can well, take them sequentially. Okay. Um, listen, you know, I have I have come to really respect the the people in in emergency services. They know much more than any of us. Even though lots of times I like to think that I I know more, but um, and I guess it's also we lost our house in the Painted K fire and. Um, I think it's really important when you're talking about a fire, like the Thomas fire that was moving so quickly, and um, the the winds uh, were were so fa so fast, and that they that they asked for the evacuation of folks. And I I get that people were um, concerned that they had to evacuate, but I've always and subsequently from our house we've had to evacuate in two other fires, and I've always felt that. Um, these people who are making the decisions are doing it for the safety of the community. And, and I know that it's, it's hard for people, you know, to evacuate, especially with small kids and, or if you're elderly. I mean, it's just, a, it's, it's a problem. Why do but you say think, if you're elderly and look at me? Why, why? I, I, I don't. <laughs> but, but I think that the focus is, and always will be, the safety of the community. And I think with the, with the mud, at least, with a with a debris flow, and seeing the tragedy that that emerged from that, um, it was just it was heartbreaking. It was horrible, and for the people who went through it, I. I and there you were know, a lot of people that didn't want to leave because of that earlier evacuation. I understand. And I understand. So, do you think that the county and specifically the sheriff uh, screwed up? Those evacuation warnings uh, for the for the debris flow. For the debris flow. Yeah. No, you know, I wasn't there. Um, I don't know what went into making their decisions. Um, I I obviously know that there's um, been criticism, but I I'm not I'm not in a position to um, critique the the decision making that they made. You, if I would if I was in the room, then I would probably right. have. Have more to say in the old days when we were in the trailer there were I was in those in the room when they were making those decisions uh, but now it's a little bit different and there's a lot of professionals who are um, making the decision uh, so. well you have been critical of the sheriff on a number of other issues uh, yes during, I have. During your, <laughs> I'm during not your, afraid uh, to criticize the um, sheriff but yeah and he's being challenged by by two deputies mm -hmm. do you plan to endorse Either I, of them? I don't know at this time. I might. I kn I've known uh, Brian for many years. Brian. Uh, Brian Olmstead. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, and, and of course, I've worked with the sheriff. You know, I serve on the um, 
the uh, the CCP, the corrections part. What's it? The it's after AB AB one hundred nine. Uh, the Community Corrections Partnership, uh, where we have where we have to allocate uh, the money that we get uh, from from the state, and so I work closely with um, all of the law enforcement partners in allocating the money. And but, but you but you disagreed a lot about the about the jail about the new jail and the programs I, that were. I disagreed um, with him when he wanted to move forward with the, another part of the jail because um, we were not assured, we didn't know of what programs were, he was going to be putting in and it was gonna cost us more money, obviously. And it was already a stretch for us to cover the, the main jail. And all I wanted from the sheriff was information on what kind of programming he had um, planned for that. And I don't, the answer wasn't forthcoming, in my opinion. So I wasn't ready. Um, and, I, and my colleagues, we didn't vote to move forward with that, even though we had a state grant, but we had to come up with um, matching funds. Right. And so, no, we didn't, we didn't move forward with that. But I did vote for the North County Jail. Um, we, need, we need the extra beds. Um, the, the current jail is in disrepair. And I've been asking uh, for a, a long time for us to have a plan of when we're going to start shutting down portions of that of the old jail, and also to start seeing a reduction in the number of inmates who are in the jail. Now, it's been, um, it, the, the good thing is, is that the courts have been responsive in looking at, um, you know, different ways that the judges will, um, um, you know. Early release. Early and, release, and, right. yeah. yeah. And also making sure that probation monitors those individuals so that they're not just out on the street. That's the other thing that I've really appreciated from my time on the board is learning more about the probation department and I've been out with probation officers you know when they've been in Santa Barbara and social workers in, in Santa Maria there's so much that goes on in the county that I'm so proud of. That people and don't see. That really. people don't see. They don't see the work that our employees are doing. They they care so much. And then the other side of how our citizens are also struggling. There's so many there's so many issues. And so So you were probably the most reluctant uh, on the board in accommodating or welcoming the recreational marijuana industry to Santa Barbara. Why? Well, let me let me put it this okay, way: Did yeah. you used to get baked at UCSB or, or yeah, not? But, you know, this is the, this is the thing about about cannabis in Santa Barbara, and um, all I was mostly concerned, as I'm sure you've heard um, from your reporters, I was really concerned about the process because the implication of this huge land use proposal was going to have a, a big impact yeah. on our community. Sure. You know, it's pumpkins or pot, you know, on, on Hollister, you know, and I, I thought that, um, that's pretty good. Pumpkins or pot. Yeah. yeah. You, you should run for election. Yeah. No, no. Go ahead. So yeah. it, it was, it was the process that was really, <clears throat> um, troubling to me. It, it didn't feel that it was open and transparent and things were moving. It felt like behind closed doors and, um, on I behalf of, on behalf of the uh, industry. Yeah, the industry is very strong. It's a very strong industry. And um, so, anyway, we are moving slowly. It's just been a painful process. Um, I, I've been against, we, we have the most temporary licenses of any county right. in the state because of um, the county's desire to, um, well, the board voted to allow the county to send a, a, a letter if the grower would complete a form. So the presumption is is that it's all... And the board finally lines. came to, to agreement on a set of regulations, which we're all going to get to vote on, I guess, in June. You're not voting on the regulations. You're going to vote on the tax. On the tax. Right. So you were the key vote in that, though, because it needed to be four to one. Mm -hmm. So it would be a majority vote. And yeah. A, yeah. And what, so, so what did you get f with that leverage that you wanted? In, in so that? I got, um, yes, I, I was quite aware that they needed my vote. Um, so I got some protections um, in 
uh, the area in eastern Goleta Valley up, well, any, anywhere where there's an urban limit, where there's an urban boundary uh, line, um, urban rural boundary line. And we have a lot of that in eastern Goleta Valley and through Goleta, uh -huh. where anyone who on a um, Ag 200 parcel has to get a CUP. So the, um, it's not just a you know, quick permit that they can get. They have to go through an entire process, an environmental process. So that was big. The other um, big, big thing that I got was the limitation of um, dispensaries because the way that the um, ordinance came to us, there was a possibility for over 150 dispensaries in the county. And I don't know if people realize that. And, and then when I pointed it out, it was, which was good. Everyone said, oh, no, we can't have that. And so I, I suggested 10, which was in accordance with our EIR, which a lot of people seem to disregard, yeah. because we did have an EIR that talked about capping not just dispensaries, but also cultivation. But anyway, um, we had um, Steve Lavignino said, well, we should, let's, let's make it eight. I was like, oh, okay. I, <laughs> I almost fell off my chair, but um, anyway. Yeah, so that. And then it still has to go to a, a vote um, right. to see if people will, will um, approve the tax. There's still, you know, some issues and, and some problems. The impact to communities. Um, interestingly, um, in Eastern Goleta Valley, it's it's not being impacted that much right now. It's mostly in Lompoc and Carpinteria, right. but um, there it's unless we have really strong controls in place, it, it could expand. You have been very deeply involved in the budget and the retirement system. And if I'm reading the most recent county retirement board valuation report, it shows that we have an unfunded liability of almost a billion dollars, 901 million. That is the difference between what's been committed and what our assets are, are currently worth. Is that an existential problem for the county financially, do you think? Is well, that sustainable? Yes, you know I'm. I've been on the retirement board for, I don't even know now, maybe six years. I just had a retirement board meeting today. Um, a lot of people may not realize that there's um, we're not part of um, uh, PERS. We have our own retirement system, and um, we are we are about thirty three billion dollars in assets and. Um, We've lowered our expectation, our rate of return, to 7%, um, which means that the county is paying more to meet that um, expectation. So it's a hit on the county, but um, the county has, has been responsible. We're paying what we need to pay. Um, we're about 76% funded. I think a couple years ago we were at 80, which is, um, what is kind of the expectation. To be 100% funded is very existential. Um, maybe, maybe 10, 20 years ago that was the case, um, but it's not the case but right 40, now. But 40% of the payroll goes to pensions, right? A lot, I don't yeah, know if it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. 30, it's a lot. 4. It's a lot. And you know, we're making changes. We're, we're talking to our employee groups about um, them putting in more money uh, so that the county doesn't have to spend as much. So we're we're in negotiations. PEPRA has um, been a help, and we also have a program right now. I I don't know the acronym, but it's almost like a, a an incentive. Uh, if people are thinking about leaving county government early, uh, there's an incentive program that we have. So, you know, I think we're being very so very responsible. So you think it's being managed? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. One of the things that defines a legacy for a politician is who, is who succeeds her, as President Trump has, I mean, <laughs> President Obama has discovered. Now, you very strongly endorse Susan Epstein to succeed you, but she, of course, suddenly and mysteriously dropped out. How concerned are you that the voters of your district did not have, they will not have the opportunity for a full and open and honest debate about the kinds of issues that we're talking about? Well, it is, it is a concern. Um, you know, that's, you know, I've always had tough elections. Um, I, I have, some, some 
supervisors, I, you know, I would be lying if I didn't say it would be nice to have a time when I didn't have a campaign um, because it, it's a lot. It's a lot to raise money and to get out there and, and do the campaigning and, you know, be talk on to TV like and talk myself, to people. Yes. But I think in the end, it's, I, for me, and I've always had tough elections. I've never had that luxury, you might say. But I think it's made me a better representative uh, because I've been able to have to articulate what's important to me. And then, you know, as I can to fulfill those promises. So when you don't have an election, especially for an open seat, I think it's a, it's a bit of a disservice for the community. But I don't think that it's not something that can be solved. In fact, I've talked to Greg, and he's actually been, um, he appreciates this input where I've, we've talked about having, um, you know, house meetings or listening sessions where he can go out into the community and meet with my constituents. My constituents in the second district are very involved. Yeah. And, um, and so that has been my suggestion to Greg, is to get out. Um, you know, he walks a lot. Um, he, and I know he would have continued to do that. Maybe he's still going to do that. But to actually go out and talk to people, talk about the issues, because walking, it's just kind of a handshake and, and yeah, you move right. on. It's an introduction. But to really sit and listen to what's important um, to the community, I, 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 think, I think it will be very valuable for him. It's, and so. Well, thank you. Our time went so fast that we didn't oh. get to a lot of stuff that I wanted to yeah. talk about. Maybe you'll come back. And I will come back. We can do this again. So thank you, Supervisor Janet Wolf, both for being thank here you. and for Always your so nice. years of community service. Thank I you. appreciate that. A quick programming note. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, Oscar Gutierrez, the longtime technical director of Newsmakers, has decided to run for city council. Because of this, uh, Oscar and the management of TV Santa Barbara agreed with newsmakers uh, that in order to avoid any appearance of conflict, we would bring on a new director. And so we welcome tonight the indefatigable J.P. Montalvo. And thank you for watching, and please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, and our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of past shows and special interviews. Thanks again to J.P., to our crew, Ashe, Ken, Suzanne, Diane, Melissa, and as always, our top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy senior executive producer, Half Freund. Good night. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.